The route of the flight is familiar, both to the colonel and his pilot. They've been over it together countless times before. The view is not pleasant. An endless barrier of barbed wire. Behind it, freshly plowed fields. These are not plowed for planting. They are plowed to remove all possible concealment and to reveal the footprints of anyone who tries to approach the barrier, seeking freedom on this side. The fences are electrified, with enough voltage to kill anyone who grasps a strand of the barbed wire, making of the satellite country on the other side a single vast concentration camp. Coming in low, the hovering helicopter provides a good look at one of the watchtowers. The communist sentries work always in pairs with a double assignment, watch for escaping citizens and watch each other. Viewed from this height, actuality can take on the sharp clarity of a symbol. For example, a typical border bridge demolished by the communists. Its main span lies in rubble on the valley floor. On either side of the break, a wide modern highway, grass growing up in its joints, a highway which leads now nowhere at all. Or consider this Czechoslovakian farming town. St. Kinsburg was its name once, and once it was active, productive, alive. Today, the only thing moving in it is the shadow of a patrol helicopter. It was too close to the border, too good an escape hatch. Its people evacuated. St. Kinsburg is earmarked for destruction. Such is this section of the Iron Curtain, different from the rest of it, only in specific geography. From here, the colonel will go on by land transport to spot check some key border points in person. One such key point is located in this concrete bunker, a border station, from which observer teams keep constant watch across the barrier. Here, machine gun, radio, telephone, and powerful binoculars are the tools of the trade. And from here, observers can flash the news of any border development on to Usura headquarters some 200 miles away within four minutes. There are other such posts manned around the clock at points all along the barrier. The colonel is traveling with a five-man roving patrol, which uses two jeeps. Both mount loaded machine guns and radio equipment which can make instant contact with the border stations, other patrols, and observation posts. Here, near the border, the vehicles of patrol units have the road to themselves. The lack of traffic would be understandable even if there were no military restrictions. Every road to the border, big or little, is a dead end. Periodically, a stop must be made to take a close look at some particular feature. Repeated, detailed inspection through field glasses, day in, day out. And anything the least bit different, a reinforcement of a section of the barrier, a change in the patrol schedule of the guards on the communist side, anything is to be reported on the spot by radio. These roving patrols provide added assurance that should the need ever arise, the alert will be swiftly passed to the armored recon units on whom would rest the responsibility for the initial delaying action. The check completed, it's back into the saddle and move out to the next stop. For the men who maintain this constant patrolling, this may not be exciting duty. Sentry duty seldom is, unless something goes wrong, but it is necessary. A break in the solitude comes when the patrol reaches a checkpoint manned by men of the West German border police. 
These men effectively maintain surveillance over a wide area with the help of their keen-nosed sentry and tracking dogs. Landis Grenza, the sign says, the frontier, and the border is that, all right, a place where one way of life leaves off and another begins. These particular checkpoints happen to be on the border between Germany and communist-held Czechoslovakia. But along other sectors of the Iron Curtain are other roving patrols like this one, constantly on the move, checking, watching across the barriers, reporting change or lack of change. It has been called a war of binoculars. So go the days of the men who make up the recon patrols. Days composed of strictly followed schedules and constant alertness. Hours of looking at terrain already familiar, searching for the unfamiliar. Watching over empty roadways, quiet between the trees, making sure they stay that way. In this report, we can only touch the highlights to impress upon you that a new sure your interests are strongly defended. Have you any idea of the strength and power of one of Usurer's armored divisions? Let me show you. It isn't often that anyone gets to see this. This is a full armored division. To give you an idea of size, each of those small dark squares includes more than a thousand men. This division, with its 14 battalions and its special troops, forms a striking force of roughly 15,000 men, with tanks, self-propelled artillery, and vehicles numbering in the thousands. Everything is ready as the commander of troops reports to General Clark, Sir, the division is formed. Never before on film has the full massed might of an armored division been assembled in a single formation. From the deck of his command jeep, Usurer's commander-in-chief will troop the line. And as we follow, you will see, in one continuous scene, the massed men, machines, and weapons of an armored division.
review is over, and 15,000 men jump to the business of getting the division ready to move out. In a matter of minutes, the men are in position, the division is ready to roll. M48 tanks, the fast-moving cavalry of the 20th century. These are fast being replaced by the even harder-hitting M60s, capable of defeating any present-day enemy armor. Personnel carriers, enough of them to race thousands of fully equipped armored infantrymen into battle and deliver them ready for action from behind their shields of armor plate. These are the sights and sounds of a full division on the move. Hundreds of jeeps, trucks, support vehicles, like the armored assault bridges, which you see in the background. The rocket artillery of today, truck-mounted Honest John missiles, a seemingly endless array of mechanized firepower. 105 self-propelled howitzers on the move. With ample room for a supply of ammunition, these can provide the highly mobile artillery support which a fast-moving force must have. Last in line come the formidable 155s. But all this, impressive as it is, is still only part of the story. More and more, the rugged and versatile helicopter is playing a major role in military operations. Without need for airstrips or parachutes, usurocopters can move troops swiftly over short distances and set them down where the action is, fresh, untired by forced marching or rugged terrain, fully equipped and ready to put their weapons into operation. weapons are the latest and best. Light Army observation planes are available to direct the mortar and artillery fire of ground forces with pinpoint accuracy to its target. Still more supporting fire is available from helicopters armed with racks of rockets. Helicopters armed with machine guns and rockets and linked by radio with ground units can be used to help neutralize specific targets in support of an infantry assault.
training is constant, too, with the bigger rockets, which are part of USARA's Sunday Punch. The mobility of the Honest John on its truck-mounted launcher, together with its nuclear capability, make it a major item in the USARA field arsenal. These missile crews reflect the increasingly technical skills which modern weapon systems require of the American soldier. Once in position, only minutes are needed for the team to zero in on target. Uncanny accuracy is the hallmark of the sleek lacrosse guided missile. Another important part of USARA's preparedness is here, several hundred feet above the Earth. USARA units are not only ready for action where they are, they are prepared to get up and go. In an era of swiftly developing situations, the capacity to react immediately and in effective force is a necessity. USARA's airborne units provide that capacity. Today, however, not all operations involve large regular forces of combat troops. Increasingly, insurgency and guerrilla operations threaten the security of free nations. Our answer in Europe to this problem lies with the men of the 10th Special Forces. The small Special Forces team does not require a large and open drop zone, and in actual practice would seldom have one. Accordingly, they train to land where the landing is dangerous, developing a skill in parachute control which lets them touch down without harm in a field studded with upright wooden stakes. With this introduction to the men of special forces, we come to the end of part one of the USARA story. In part two, you will see the highly demanding training which goes into the making of these skilled and dedicated specialists in unconventional warfare and other vital aspects of the USARA story, the United States Army in Europe. One such key point is located in this concrete bunker, a border station, from which observer teams keep constant watch across the barrier. Here, machine gun, radio, telephone, and powerful binoculars are the tools of the trade. And from here, observers can flash the news of any border development onto USARA headquarters some 200 miles away within four minutes. There are other such posts manned around the clock at points all along the barrier. The colonel is traveling with a five-man roving patrol, which uses two jeep making of the satellite country on the other side a single vast concentration camp. Coming in low, the hovering helicopter provides a good look at one of the watchtowers. The communist sentries work always in pairs with a double assignment, watch for escaping citizens and watch each other. Viewed from this height, actuality can take on the sharp clarity of a symbol. The route of the flight is familiar, both to the colonel and his pilot. They've been over it together countless times before. The view is not pleasant. An endless barrier of barbed wire, Behind it, freshly plowed fields. These are not plowed for planting. They are plowed to remove all possible concealment and to reveal the footprints of anyone who tries to approach the barrier, seeking freedom on this side. The fences are electrified with enough voltage to kill anyone who grasps a strand of the barbed wire, escape hatch. Its people evacuated. St. Kinsperk is earmarked for destruction. Such is this section of the Iron Curtain, different from the rest of it, only in specific geography. From here, the Colonel will go on by land transport to spot check some key border points in person.
For example, a typical border bridge demolished by the communists. Its main span lies in rubble on the valley floor. On either side of the break, a wide modern highway, grass growing up in its joints, a highway which leads now nowhere at all. Or consider this Czechoslovakian farming town. St. Kinsburg was its name once, and once it was active, productive, alive. Today, the only thing moving in it is the shadow of a patrol helicopter. It was too close to the border, too good an 